What's up? And welcome to episode two of the Five Seconds on the Clock podcast, the long-awaited episode two. I was in Atlanta this past week, but I'm back and have a lot to talk about. First, let me talk about my time in Atlanta. One of my friends from college works in ticket sales with the Atlanta Hawks. So I contacted him and told him I was interested in going to an Atlanta Dream game because they play in State Farm Arena, which is where the Hawks play. He was able to get his tickets, and I was super excited because that meant I would be able to see two of my favorite players and one of my favorite teams, the Las Vegas Aces. Liz Cambage and Asia Wilson are two of my favorite players, so I was real excited I got to see them in my first experience at a WNBA game. And he ended up getting tickets from one of his clients. So we were in like, I think it was called a social club and it was all you can eat and all you can drink. So that was really a great all around experience. The Atlanta Dream ended up winning the game. So my aces lost, but it was still okay because it was my first WNBA game. But the main reason I went to Atlanta was for a career expo at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, the home of the Atlanta Falcons and Atlanta United, Atlanta's major league soccer team. There were a number of professional organizations from Atlanta and surrounding areas. I talked to teams like the Atlanta Hawks, Atlanta Dream, Atlanta United, Harlem Globetrotters, Tennessee Titans, and a few others. They also had a few speakers and tours of the Atlanta Falcons and Atlanta United locker room. It was pretty cool for me to see the locker rooms because Atlanta United is my favorite MLS team, so it was one of my favorite parts of the expo. Most of the teams there were looking to hire people for ticket sales, but some of the organizations did mention they had openings for some communications jobs, which is where most of my experience is. But with that being said, I did attend a sales development program with the Atlanta Hawks while I was down there. It was basically a six hour class where myself and about 20 other candidates would role play as if we were selling tickets to customers over the phone. And we had the opportunity to interview with some managers in the sales department. So I really enjoyed it. And it gave me a chance to network and get some business cards from people working in the professional sports industry. But enough with me. I got a lot I want to address on today's episode, especially in the NFL. But before we get to the main topic, let's visit some other news going on. I'll start with Team USA Basketball, who lost to France and Serbia this week in the 2019 FIBA World Cup. After those two losses, the highest Team USA can finish in this tournament is 7th, and that result is absolutely unacceptable. Team USA has a standard when it comes to international play. It's basically gold or nothing. And yeah, I know a lot of star players remove their name from World Cup competition and turn down the opportunity to play for the United States and China. So this isn't a squad with any superstars or any big names, minus Kimba Walker maybe. But nonetheless, all these guys play in the NBA and should be able to beat most of the team, most of the teams in international play. I mean, it's still a pretty good squad. You got guys like Donovan Mitchell, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Kimba Walker, like I mentioned, Miles Turner, Marcus Smart. Chris Middleton, etc. But it's been a rough going for the U.S. And not only will they not bring home the gold, they won't even medal. And like I previously stated, the best they can finish is in seventh place. So this is basically new territory for the U.S. Ever since the Dream Team in 92, the U.S. are used to winning, at least meddling. You know, they got bronze in 2004, which triggered the Redeem Team in 2008 with Kobe, D-Wade, LeBron, and all those guys. But the USA is definitely not used to this. This is new territory, and they must rebound next year in Tokyo at the Olympics. But I think next year you're going to see those big names. Some of the bigger stars are definitely going to go to Tokyo in the Olympics. I don't know if guys really care about the World Cup like they used to. And it might not necessarily be that they don't care about the World Cup. They also have things to worry about in the league as far as contracts and injuries and stuff like that, and they don't want to risk that. We'll stay on the hardwood, but let's shift our focus to the WNBA because the playoffs started earlier this week. I want to start by talking about the playoff format in the WNBA. It used to be East versus West, just like it is in the NBA. But now the best eight teams make it to the playoffs, and the WNBA is a 12-team league. So basically, all but four teams make the playoffs. So they have four rounds, just like in the NBA. But the difference is, it's a first round, a second round, semifinals, and then the finals. So the top two teams in the regular season get a two-round bye. The next two teams, so three and four, get a first-round bye. Now, the first and second round are single elimination games, so you don't play a series. It's just one game, and the winner moves on. And now I'm going to get into the seeding for the WNBA playoffs. Finishing number one, arguably the best team all season, is the Washington Mystics, led by Elena Deladon. If EDD doesn't win MVP, then there's something wrong with the league, but I know for sure she definitely will have to win because she's been the best player in the league from start to finish. Number two seed, the Connecticut Sun. Number three seed, L.A. Sparks. Number four, Las Vegas Aces. Number five, Chicago Sky. 
Chicago Sky, I would say they were surprised this year. I really don't think a lot of people expected them to make the playoffs, but they did. Um, I think the growth of Diamond the Shields really helped them in this one key reason they made the playoffs. Number six, the Seattle Storm. Number seven, Minnesota Lynx. And number eight, the Phoenix Mercury. Now, two games have already been played. On Wednesday, the Chicago Sky beat the Phoenix Mercury 105-76. to Diamond the Shields finished with 25 points, four rebounds, and three assists. And like I was saying, her development in her second year is a big reason the Sky were able to surprise people and make the playoffs this year. The Sky will play the Las Vegas Aces on Sunday at 5 p.m. on ESPN2. For the Mercury, they could never really get fully healthy this season. Hall of Framer and arguably the best player in WNBA history, Diana Taurasi, was injured for a majority of the season. But the team did great just to make the playoffs with Taurasi missing so much time. Brittany, Gr- Brittany Griner and Dewana Bonner really carried the team and put them on their backs all season. Breon January was a key part of the Mercury success this season. If they're fully healthy next season, I would say watch out because they are definitely sure to be a contender next season with a fully healthy roster. The other game on Wednesday was between the defending champion Seattle Storm and the Minnesota Lynx. The Storm ended up coming out on top 84-74. Jordan Canada led the way. She had 26 points, 3 rebounds, and 4 assists for the Storm. I talked about the Mercury's dealing with injuries, but perhaps no team has been hit with injuries bigger than the Storm. Seattle lost its top two players in reigning regular season and finals MVP, Brianna Stewart, and future Hall of Famer and three-time champion, Sue Bird. Now, Natasha Howard stepped up big time in the absence of Stewart and Bird. She was an all-star this year. She averaged 18 points to eight rebounds. And earlier this week, it was announced that she was selected as the Defensive Player of the Year. So not only has she been the team's leading scorer, she was also a leader and an anchor on the defensive side of the ball. And despite not having their top two stars, the Storm still make the playoffs and beat a very good Lynx team who are missing some key players of their own. Maya Moore sat out this season for reasons bigger than basketball, a personal year off for her to focus on her faith and doing things in the community. Lindsey Whalen retired and is now the coach of the University of Minnesota women's basketball team. The team also lost rookie Jessica Shepard to a torn ACL early in the season, and veteran Rebecca Brunson missed the whole season with a concussion. It's been a rough year for the Link, but I'm still impressed that Sylvia Fowles, Nafisha Collier, and Odyssey Sims were able to lead the Lynx to the playoff regardless. Now that the Storm have advanced to the second round, they will face the LA Sparks on Sunday at 3 p.m. also on ESPN. And the top two seeds, the Washington Mystics and the Connecticut Sun, have a bye until the semifinals, so they don't have to play in the second round. So they won't play until early next week, Tuesday, I believe. Now to college football. To me, there's still only five legitimate teams that are true contenders to win a national title. Clemson, Bama, Georgia, Oklahoma, and Ohio State. LSU is currently ranked number four. Joe Burrows look great. That Tigers offense looked impressive in the first two weeks, especially last week in that 45-38 win on the road over Texas. Burrows showed up and showed out in that top 10 matchup. LSU came in ranked number six, and Texas was number nine. Burrow finished 31 of 39 for 471 yards, four touchdowns to just one interception. But still, I don't think LSU can make it through the SEC and beat both Bama and Georgia. While Georgia isn't on their schedule, if they beat Bama and end up representing the SEC West in the SEC championship game, they will most likely be facing the Bulldogs. I think it'll be a tough task for LSU to beat both of those teams, so while they look like a potential contender as of now, I think at the end of the day, the SEC schedule will prove too much for the Tigers to overcome. That's just my opinion, but we will see. The five players I've been most impressed with through the first two weeks, this is on the offensive side of the ball, are Jalen Hurts out of Oklahoma. He looked amazing week one. Everybody was ready to crown him the Heisman winner after his week one performance. And in week two, he didn't disappoint either. So he's definitely my, I would say he's the leader in the clubhouse right now as far as the Heisman race. And he's the player I've been most impressed with through the first two weeks. After that, of course, Joe Burrow. I just mentioned what he did against Texas on the road in a big top 10 matchup. You got to throw him in there. After that, I have Jonathan Taylor, the running back out of Wisconsin. I mean, he just does what he's done his whole career. He's consistent. He always puts up big numbers. And his impact is always felt on the game. I feel like whatever he does in the game always has an impact and has a difference in whether Wisconsin wins or loses. After that, I'm going to go Justin Fields, quarterback at Ohio State. He's looked impressive his first two games. He has nine total touchdowns in his first two games with the Buckeyes, and that ties a school record set by Dwayne Haskins last year. And I think he's just on pace to continue improving each week. So it could be real dangerous for the Big Ten. Watch out for Justin Fields. He's looked very impressive in his first two starts, but I think he still has a lot to work on, and that could be scary for other teams in the Big Ten and beyond. 
After that, I'm going to go with Tua. Tua Tunga Viola, of course. I mean, he's almost picked up right where he left off last season. Of course, not the title game because he doesn't want to remember that performance. But as far as what he did throughout the regular season, Tua looks like the same player he was from last year and a potential top five pick in next year's NFL draft. From the gridiron, we're going to go to the diamond now. Big news out of the MLB, Kristen Yelich fractured his kneecap and he's out for the rest of the season and that is a big blow for the Brewers. It definitely hurts their postseason chances. Right now they're behind the Cubs for the second wild card and final playoff spot in the National League but without Yelich I doubt they'll be able to get that done. It also hurts his chances to win his second straight MVP. He and Cody Bellinger have been battling it out for MVP basically all season. Speaking of Cody Bellinger, his Dodgers became the first team to clinch a playoff spot this season and they clinched their seventh straight NL West title. So their continued dominance in the NL West is one reason why they're always a favorite to win the World Series. Now we know recently, even though they've been there, they haven't been able to come out on top. But maybe this is their year. They're still fighting it out with teams like the Astros and the Yankees for the best record in the MLB and home field advantage throughout the playoffs. So we'll see how that goes for the Dodgers. But now it's time for the main topic, my reaction to week one in the NFL. Of course, I have to start with A.B., Antonio Brown. This time last week, A.B. was still a member of the Oakland Raiders. He had just got into it with GM Mike Mayock and was supposed to be facing a suspension from the team. And then head coach John Gruden comes out and says he won't be suspended. and He'll be on the field for the Raiders in week one as the team hosted the Broncos. All of this comes after A.B. missed time in training camp because of frostbite on the bottom of his feet, followed by him missing like two weeks over his grievance against the NFL because the league banned the helmet he used his entire career. He even threatened to retire if he couldn't wear his old helmet. As we know, that didn't happen. After Gruden announced that Brown would be on the field week one, Brown released a conversation between he and John Gruden on YouTube, which I'm pretty sure was meant to be a private conversation between Gruden, Brown, and Brown's agent, Drew Rosenhaus. And then, the next morning, it's announced that the Raiders fined Brown over $215,000 and voided the $29.125 million guaranteed in his contract he signed in March with the Raiders. After finding out that the $29.125 guaranteed money on his contract was being voided, the next morning, he made a post on IG asking to be released. Hours later, he was released and he was eligible to sign with any other team by, I think, 4 1 p.m. that day. A little over an hour after 4 o'clock, I got the alert on my phone and then I looked up at the TV and saw that Brown had signed with the Patriots. And what's funny about that is because a lot of people, even myself, were joking, like, watch A.B. end up with the Pats. But even when it happened, it was like, oh, my God, like, this is really happening. We joked about it, but now it's really official. But that's not where it stops for A.B. Before his first, yes, before he could even touch the practice field one time with the Patriots, Brown was accused of sexual assault by a former trainer who alleges he sexually assaulted her on three different occasions. Brown will still play this week for the Patriots because the NFL has not had a chance to speak with Brittany Taylor, the young lady accusing Brown in the case. But man, at this point, I'm like, what's next? When he made his way out of Pittsburgh, it looked like it could have been because of his relationship with Big Ben and because of the lack of guaranteed money in his contract with the Steelers. And then he went to the Raiders and it was a complete circus while he was there. Didn't play one single snap, not even preseason. Now he goes to the Pats and before he can even hit the practice field, his name is in the news again. It's just a lot going on around A.B. right now, and I don't know how long he's going to survive in New England because clearly the team looks like they can win without him. Speaking of the Pats, they look super impressive as they dominated Brown's old team, the last team he played a game for, the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Patriots dominated from start to finish, and they beat the Steelers 33-3 in Foxborough as they begin their title defense. Speaking of Brown's old teams, the Raiders beat the Broncos 24-16 in the second game of a Monday Night Football season debut and doubleheader on ESPN, and I thought they looked pretty impressive and pretty inspired doing it. Raiders fans definitely deserve it after the up and down offseason, but the game of the week was the first game of that Monday Night Football doubleheader between the New Orleans Saints and the Houston Texans and the Mercedes-Benz Superdome. In the first half, the Texans were a better team. They took a 14-3 lead into halftime, but in the second half, the Saints got back into the game. The Saints ended up taking a 27-21 lead with just 50 seconds in the fourth. That's a pretty good position to be in with 50 seconds left, right? Well, two plays and 13 seconds later, Deshaun Watson hooked up with newly acquired Kenny Steels from the Miami Dolphins for a 36-yard touchdown pass to give the Texans a 28-27 lead. Again, 
a nice position to be in with only 30 seconds remaining in the game and regaining the lead in only 13 seconds. Not quite. It only took six plays for the Saints to get in field goal position and set up Will Lutz for a 58-yard game-winning field goal as time expired. The Saints won 30-28 to in what could end up being one of the best games of the 2019-2020 season, and that came in just week one. I think both teams definitely looked like contenders after that week one performance. Both quarterbacks came up big in big moments, and I think that it will be good for both teams as we head further into the season. Other impressive performances came in Miami and Dallas. Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens throttled the Dolphins 59-10. Jackson finished 17-20 of with 324 passing yards, five touchdowns, and a perfect passer rating. Mark Ingram, who the team signed in the offseason, finished with 107 rushing yards and two touchdowns on 14 carries in his debut with the team. Marquise Hollywood Brown, the younger cousin of A.B., if I might add, had four catches for 147 yards and two touchdowns in his NFL debut. It's sure to be a long season for the Dolphins, and they don't get a break as they face the Patriots in the A.B., in week two as he's expected to make his debut for the Patriots in his home state of Florida. From Miami to Dallas, the Cowboys beat the Giants 35-17 to and that Cowboys offense looked very explosive. Dak Prescott threw for 405 yards and four touchdowns and spread the ball out to all of his weapons including Amari Cooper, Jason Witten, who's back with the Cowboys after one season of calling Monday Night Football for ESPN. Michael Gallup also looked very impressive. He led the team with 158 receiving yards and Randall Cobb, who the team signed during the offseason, had 69 receiving yards and a touchdown. The team that received the most hype and most attention this offseason, the Cleveland Browns, didn't perform too well in their season debut. They lost 43-13. to Let me say that again. 43-13 to in their season opener at home versus the Titans. While the Titans aren't like a juggernaut and we can't like downplay them because they are a good team, you shouldn't lose to them by 30 points, especially in week one and especially after you had all that hype surrounding your team. you got to show up. Baker Mayfield finished with one touchdown to three interceptions. OBJ had seven receptions for 71 yards, but most of the attention around him was around the watch that he wore during the game. OBJ wore a Richard Milley watch that was worth around $200,000, and he wore this on the field. It must be nice. I'm trying to see 200 k in my lifetime, and he wore a watch worth 200 k in a football game where people flying around as fast as they can to hit you? Oh, yeah, you got it nice. But speaking of old faces and new places, Le'Veon Bell made his debut with the New York Jets. Bell had 60 yards on 17 carries and one receiving touchdown in his first game as a member of the Jets. The Jets did lose, though, in a close game as they fell 17-16 to the Buffalo Bills. The Eagles got off to a slow start but eventually got it together versus the Redskins. Deshaun Jackson played great in his return to Philly. He grabbed eight catches for 154 yards and two touchdowns. And the Eagles beat the Redskins 32-27. The team that lost in last year's Super Bowl, the LA Rams, beat the Carolina Panthers 30-27. The team that finished a game away from the Super Bowl last season, the Kansas City Chiefs, looked like they picked up right where they left off, beating the Jacksonville Jaguars 40-27. Nick Foles, a new starting quarterback for the Jags, he went down with a broken clavicle. Man, that's bad for them. His first game, he just signed that big contract with the Jags, and he goes down. And he won't return until week 11 at the earliest. Number one overall pick, Kyler Murray, made his debut. It started off rough for him with the Arizona Cardinals, but in the fourth, he found a rhythm. He finished 29-54, passing for 308 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. And in his first game, he and the Arizona Cardinals finished in a 27-27 tie with the Detroit Lions. And that wraps up today's conversation. I'm excited for week two. One game has already been played. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers beat the Carolina Panthers 20-14 on Thursday Night Football. There are a few marquee matchups to watch out for in Week 2. The Pats at the Dolphins, of course, because A.B. is expected to make his debut. The Steelers host the Seahawks. Pittsburgh looks to bounce back after that embarrassing loss at the hands of the Patriots last week. After their impressive win over the Atlanta Falcons in Week 1, Minnesota travels to Green Bay to take on the Packers. The Chiefs play the Raiders in Week 2. That's sure to be interesting just to see how the Chiefs' offense is looking without Tyreek Hill, who will miss some time, and because of the A.B. drama still looming over the Raiders, even though A.B. is now in New England with the Patriots. The Jets play host of the Browns, and OBJ says he'll watch out for the dirty shots Jets defensive coordinator Greg Williams tells his players to make. Now, Williams does have a little bit of a history with Mountie Gate when he was the defensive coordinator with the Saints. 
And how can football fans not be excited about the rematch of the NFC Championship game? The Saints will play the Rams in LA in what is sure to be an exciting game with a lot of emotions, especially for the Saints after how last season ended with the no call on the pass interference and eventually an overtime loss to the Rams in the postseason. A lot to look forward to in week two. A lot more coming from the 5 Seconds on the Clock podcast. Thank you for listening. I love doing this podcast, and I love the feedback, love, and support I've been showing so far. That is all for this week's episode of the 5 Seconds on the Clock podcast. I'm Brandon Williams signing out. Talk to you guys soon. Ya dig.